Welcome to the Good Food CFO Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Delavan, once again, joined by our producer, Chelsea Steer. Hey, Sarah. So this episode is airing on Monday, June 10th. And we're actually recording this segment right now on Friday, June 7th, because we had some breaking news that we saw this week in the Foxtrot story, which, you know, if you've been listening, you know, we covered here in a whole episode of the podcast. And I actually haven't had the chance yet to even look into the story, but I know that you have. So I was kind of hoping you could fill me in today. I would love to. Um Suffice it to say that Foxtrot is back. Wow. <laughs> uh, founder Mike Lavatola is planning to reopen this summer in Chicago, Dallas, and Austin, Texas. Now, the number of stores is being reported a little bit differently depending on which news source you look at. So it's somewhere between 12 to 15 locations being reported as, as going to reopen at the time of this recording. They're not all going to open at once, and we can kind of get into what that rollout will look like, but that's the news. And suffice it to say that in the midst of a very busy consulting day, when I saw this information, I was like, oh my God, I need to know more. Yeah. So I that's what I have to know. I, so what I heard and you know, you kind of shared with me was that people were seeing and sharing this all over Instagram. Is that really where Foxtrot made this announcement? It is. <laughs> to my knowledge and, and where I saw the information was indeed on Instagram. I actually saw a former, like a brand who whose product was formerly in Foxtrot, right? They had posted, they had sort of reposted Foxtrot's Instagram post with like a, what? Like, is this really happening? Yeah. You know, and of course they had thoughts. And of course I was like, oh my goodness, I need to go to the internet. But it was literally on their Instagram, the, the, the existing Foxtrot Instagram page all of the historical posts had been deleted. And then one new post was made. It's sort of like an image of a sky. And it said a new Foxtrot with some old friends coming soon. All right. <laughs> so tell me more, like you said some locations were opening, some aren't. What what exactly does that look like? Yeah. So if you recall, there were 33 stores operating at the time of the very abrupt closure, which happened toward the end of April. And reports are saying that stores are not going to reopen in DC, Maryland, and Virginia. So again, what we know today is that stores will reopen in Chicago, Dallas, and Austin. And stores will start to open in as soon as six to eight weeks. So according to Eater Chicago, Lavatola says that in, in six to eight weeks, stores in Old Town and Gold Coast, which are both Chicago locations, will reopen, and that he's planning to reopen 15 stores total, with more than half of them being in Chicago. He also says that the reopened stores will reportedly have the same layout and merchandising. So I want to pause here for a second because Articles, it Lavatola has been quoted as saying, like, we want to focus on on making these stores healthy. Um, mm. which right, so it's 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 pretty interesting. He was asked if he had a message for workers who had suddenly lost their jobs, and to that he said that he was sorry that they found themselves in that situation, and that we want to do what we can to be there for them now in this new version of Foxtrot and really provide opportunities. In regard to the unpaid invoices, right, yeah. to the brands and the vendors that that supplied Foxtrot previously, he sort of avoided the questions a bit. But what he did say or what was said in, in a couple of the articles was that Fox, Foxtrot's former parent company, if you remember, that's called OutFox, that filed for bankruptcy, hadn't furnished Lavatola 
and sort of this new version of Foxtrot with information regarding those invoices. But he's been personally reaching out to vendors for updates. Now, it's been so soon since we've read this news. I've not had a chance to talk to like some of my clients and community members who maybe you know, who had been supplying Fox shots. So I don't, I'm sure he hasn't reached out to everyone. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's sort of the news on, on that part of it. Okay. But so from what you were just saying, are, are, are we to understand that Lavatola was not involved at Foxtrot during the abrupt closure and, and like the bankruptcy and everything? Yeah. So Rob Twyman, Right. Mm-hmm. He had just taken over as CEO on March 11th. He was replacing Liz Williams, who went on to, to another company and, and to be CEO, you know, somewhere else on that date. So Labatola's involvement was as a board member. Mm. So he says, um, again, um, this is actually according to Cranes Chicago. And as usual, we've linked to all of the sources that we've utilized and that we're quoting here um, in this news segment. But Lavatola is quoted as saying, I still have my own questions as to what happened. He says, I think everyone was really surprised that a brand that was this strong with customers and this strong with vendors could just fold up. And he goes on to say that it was painful to sit on the sidelines watching the company he founded struggle. He said he never wanted to leave Foxtrot, the company that he started, but he was pushed out. And he is quoted as saying that this was the worst thing that's ever happened to me by a long shot. So I also think something really interesting in the Eater Chicago article is what Lavatola says about the funding, what the funding led to in Foxtrot and led to in terms of him as he says, being pushed out of the organization. So reading a bit from the article, it says that Lavatola also concedes that when you raise a lot of money, reportedly $194 million, you attract, quote, a lot of parties around the table, end quote. And that brings a different set of expectations that don't necessarily align with the chain's original mission. He says, Foxtrot's story isn't unlike many businesses that raise large amounts of capital, especially if they did so in 2021 and 2022. Most are all dealing with drastic market shifts and trying to figure out how to survive. It sounds like Lavatola has been listening to the podcast. (laughs) I mean, he's been living it, it sounds like, right? And I think, you know, we were doing a case study of Foxtrot and utilizing the information and experiences that I've had as a CFO and with founders, right? With just taking in the news, the conversation we had with Melissa from City Capital, you know, the goal is always to learn, right? And then we, you, you and I said that during during the Foxtrot episode, I think you said it so eloquently, like the reason we strive to understand history is so that we don't repeat it again. And there are so many founders who have been sort of, as I'm sure they would say, pushed out of their seat as CEO when, you know, funding comes in and growth at all costs becomes the the primary goal, you know, and, and someone else with, you know, experience doing that steps into the CE role in their place. Sometimes they remain on the board. Sometimes they don't. I think the big takeaway here is that the more, the more involvement you have, Mm -hmm. the harder it can be for you to maintain your vision as the founder of the business, right? I've even been party to, you know, I've been a party to very healthy investor relationships, you know, but at the end of the day, many of them have, many founders have relationships with their primary investors, some of whom own the majority stake of the company, right? And you've got to go to them to get approval to make certain decisions, not all, but but many of them. And, and they're usually, you know, dictated in the contract that you've signed, right? In the agreement that you've signed um, when you take on, you know, their equity or whatever form of investment it is. So it's an interesting thing. You know, I think that much like venture capital has been touted as like the end all be all for brands for so many years now, we're finding out that 
you know, and, and, and how that kind of turns out for a lot of people, right? Like the fact that unicorns aren't really unicorns and, and many of them are never profitable and, and go out of business, right? We've talked about that, you know, yeah. at great lengths as well. It's like, we're also finding out that like there is a downside to investment in some cases. And I think it, as with so many things, is about understanding what you're getting into, understanding what you're agreeing to, understanding what you are giving up. And I think that my hope is as we do this learning and as we see and read and hear about these realities for so many founders, that that prompts other founders to really do their homework, to find out what options do they have you know, if fundraising and and getting capital is something that they need for their business and want for their business, what's the best way for them to do it? Because there's no one size fits all solution for that, right? Absolutely. So this really brings me to the question, how is Lavatola even doing this? How is he reopening these stores? Yeah. Well, it, this felt very juicy to read, <laughs> um, <laughs> but but it, it makes sense, right? So Lavatola is working with a company called Further Point Enterprises. So when Outfox filed for bankruptcy, their assets went to auction on May 10th. And what happened on that day is that there was one bid and one bid only for Foxtrot's assets. It doesn't seem like like Dom's assets weren't purchased. It was just Foxtrot's, which I also find interesting since they were technically yeah, like under had the same just, and had just merged. Yeah, yeah, but so this one bid was in the amount of two point two million dollars. And there was speculation on the internet that Lavatola was connected with this firm in mm. some way. So as the only bidder, Further Point Enterprises is now the owner of Foxtrot's assets. And Lavatola is quoted as saying, it's the right thing to do. I mean, that's the end of it, right? So it's like, there's no denial that in reading the articles like earlier today and, and yesterday that Lavatola wanted his company back. He hadn't, it seems like he hadn't given up on the dream and that he, you know, saw it ending, saw it end and found a way, which I have so much respect for, honestly, I think, right. To be like, this is mine. And like, I want it back. And I, and I want to try to do right as best I can by the employees and and the brands. He's not going to be able to open 33 stores. It doesn't make sense to do that. Um, but I, yeah, I think I think there's something to be said about that drive. And it sounds like, you know, if we're assuming best intention, like he is now having an opportunity to, as you said, get back in the driver's seat with the perspective that he has now yeah, and build it differently, build it on yeah. his terms. Yeah. Yeah. So we – we're able to find out some information. I can't remember which article this was in, but again, we have all of the sources will be linked in the show notes. According to court documents that were filed on May 31st in the U.S. Bankruptcy Court for the District of Delaware, Further Point Enterprises has entered into six new leases with landlords for previous locations of Foxtrot stores. Mm-hmm. So we know that six locations will be coming back in Chicago, despite him only naming two specific locations that will be opening in in the next six to eight weeks from now. The court records also show that the bankruptcy trustee for Foxtrot is recommending terminating all of Foxtrot's unexpired leases, quote, to maximize the value of the estates and eliminate unnecessary burdens. And I think that goes both ways. Yeah. Right. Like if we're not going to open stores in many of these former locations, let's let's cut the leases and and allow, you know, those buildings to, you know, to rent out to other other mm-hmm. businesses. The trustee has assessed the leases and the contracts and determined that they have no economic value and are not in any way helpful to the administration of the estates, according to the court records. So, you know, it's really interesting. I I wasn't expecting this. I was quite surprised to see, you know, the the news on Instagram and um I'm going to be interested in in following what happens next and and seeing, you know, if Lavatola can revive Foxtrot 
in sort of that original way that he had intended um, to be a bit smaller, to, to perhaps be more profitable and to, to really bring value to the communities that, that the stores are in. Yeah, this seems like a bit of a hopeful story, right? I, I am really interested to see how they do address the unpaid invoices and those mm-hmm. partnerships with brands. Yeah. If we see anything in the news about that, we'll definitely share it. This is our season finale, so it, we will probably share it like on Instagram or in our newsletter or somewhere else that we can get you the information really fast. But yeah, more to come, I guess. Yeah. And now we need to talk about today's episode. You just mentioned that it is the season finale. We are ending season 10 with Mm -hmm. a Baba Yacht episode. And I am joined by the founder of Monty's, Lauren Montgomery. As you'll hear in the episode, Lauren and I met in August of 2022. It was at a time of sort of great change in her business. And she was figuring things out. And she was recommended for the podcast and by, by some community members. And I thought to myself, my goodness, she's the perfect person to have on the podcast for a Bobby Yacht episode because she has done so much work putting her business sort of on pause in many ways and, and recalibrating, as we say during the episode, to get Monty's on the right track and, and building on Lauren's terms. Yeah, I think one big theme that I took away from the conversation was trusting the process. Yeah. Right? Yep. Doing the work, digging in, built setting that foundation and just trusting that that's the right work to be doing. Yeah. And I think too something else that that she really talks about and I think is also another theme is not being concerned with what other people are doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Not comparing yourself and just, yeah, being on your own path. Something we say on our team a lot is running your own race. And I think that's very much what what Lauren's doing. So, Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's time to to have our listeners get into the main episode. It's been a great season with you, Chelsea. I'll see you in season 11. All right. Sounds good. Let's get to it. As a good food founder, do you ever feel like your work is done in a silo? Is it difficult to feel confident in your business and financial decisions because you don't have a sounding board? Well, in our weekly CFO office hours, you'll not only get the chance to work shoulder to shoulder with the good food CFO herself, Sarah Delavan, but also with a small group of your peers. Together, you can support each other through the work of building a business on your own terms. Passes are available now on our website. Just visit thegoodfoodcfo.com and click on services. And now back to the show. Lauren, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Sarah. I always like to let our audience know like how we connected or like how, you know, guests end up on our show. And I'm excited to share that you are actually a founder who was recommended, suggested and recommended to be on the podcast by a couple of different folks in our community. So I'm sure that they're going to be super excited to see that this episode has been recorded and and to know that you're here. It's so sweet. I'm flattered. Thank you for having me. So you and I actually met one another back in 2020, but before we kind of talk about that and, and kind of, you know, why the founders in our community recommended you to be on our podcast, I'd love for you to share a little bit about your brand, Monty's, sort of the origin story and, and a little bit about your product. Sure. Monty's comes from my last name. My name's Lauren Montgomery, but it's my nickname. It's very personal to me. I make the cleanest ingredient, cashew cream cheese and plant-based butter on the market. Our cream cheese is made with just three ingredients, cashews, culture, sea salt. It's fermented. I am a huge fermentation nerd. I really started this five years ago out of a passion. I've been dairy-free and really focused on nutrition since at least high school, I would say, and just really in tune with how how food makes me feel and conscientious of what I put in my body. This is something that it feels like it's been a long time coming, but yeah, it was a passion that I've really had forever. And I started Monty's, like I said, about five years ago. And, you know, I tried a lot of different things before then. And I went to business school and I 
worked in fashion and I always kept coming back to like my passion for nutrition and wellness. And I was spending so much of my personal time focused on that and food and wellness. So I wanted to dip my toe into it. I got my health coaching certification and then I went to Natural Gourmet Institute to go to their chef's training program where I learned about health supportive food and we did a lot of dairy free alternatives and fermentation. And that's really what started it. I think for so long, I was like looking for the thing that would light me up fully. And I feel like first week of culinary school, I knew I found my thing. I'm like, oh, why didn't I do this sooner? But, you know, I kind of like put all these other pieces together first and they were an essential part of the journey. But it really feels kind of like this culmination of all of my passions into one. Like I said, it really started as a passion and something that I created because I fell in love with the process of making dairy-free alternatives and the fermentation process. And I, at the time when I started, uh, there was nothing on the market that was super clean ingredient like this and that actually tasted like really good, you know, like their counterparts, the dairy counterparts of cream cheese and butter. So it really kind of was like perfect timing when I started and found my thing, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. Since then, it's been a roller coaster of a journey. As you know, it's been amazing. I feel like I've really stuck to my guardrails in terms of the products that I want to create and bring to market that, that I originally started with and I the products that I made for myself and the integrity of them. So I'm really proud of that. Obviously, a lot has happened in between, but really the products and the mission and the values and the fundamentals have stayed the same. Yeah. I remember when we, when we did meet and I'll get into that in a second. And I learned about your product. We were going on retreat, the, the, the gals in my business, we were going on a retreat to Joshua tree. And I said, we have to get some of Monty's like, we're going to have breakfast together. And like, I totally wanted to try it. And so we got, I mean, I'm a huge dill fan. And so at the time you had a dill cream cheese, I think we got the like original cream cheese and then we got some butter. And I don't think I've talked about it too much here on the podcast, but I was a vegetarian for a while and this was years ago. And I think it was, you know, it was back before there were a lot of vegetarian and vegan products on the market. There were, I was eating so much soy that it was really actually kind of messing with me. And so for my health and my body, I did return to eating animal products because that's what works for me. I and mean, I source as, you know, as best I can from all the amazing farmers and ranchers that I know, fishers. But when I discovered your product, it was kind of one of the first like alternatives or like dairy alternatives, non-dairy products where I was like, this tastes bomb. And it really truly is clean. There is not, you know, gums, no fillers, none of that stuff that kind of eventually kind of kept me away from the alternative foods and beverages because I I kind of tend toward like the cleanest, purest things. And I think sometimes when you are dealing in the world of like dairy alternatives or meat alternatives, you have to sometimes make some concessions on like mm-hmm. what is being added into that product. And so I don't know. I just, I, I love your product. And here's another thing is I don't eat dairy. So like animal milk, like cow's milk, especially like doesn't help me at all. It does me no favors. And I love butter and cheeses. And so that is the one area where I do like to kind of dabble in alternative products. And yours is by far my favorite. I think it's so delicious. And the integrity of your product and the, and the very short ingredient list is something that makes me really like happy and, and easy to pick it up off the shelf and buy. I love that. Thank you so much. I, I feel like every time, you know, I hear that I'm still like, oh my gosh, there's people like me that want these, you know, clean ingredient, amazing tasting things. It never gets lost on me or never gets old. So thank you. I appreciate that. I I made it for us and (laughs) to, to make, you know, something where we don't feel like we have to give up anything. And it's just, you know, delicious in its own right, really rooted in, you know, traditional cheesemaking principles. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. We met in August of 2022. And at that time, and we were connected by Felice Thorpe. I mention her name on the podcast so often, such a good friend of the podcast, such an amazing community member, but you were making some changes in your business. You were like, changing where you were selling your product, you were recalibrating your prices, you were making some changes around shipping. Can you kind of frame up for our listeners sort of what was happening in your business and maybe what was sparking some of this change and recalibration, as I said, that you were embarking on? 
Definitely. You came to me the perfect time. <laughs> so yeah, a couple of years ago, I was going through a big business transition. I feel like early on, you know, I, like I said, I started this out of a passion and then got a little bit starry eyed and saw the potential of it as a mm -hmm. business, you know, and I think I went too fast, ultimately, mm -hmm. you know, trying to scale the business and grow the first couple of years. And so when we met, I was really in this calibration mode of taking a step back and figuring out how to build a sustainable business. Mm. And so we did a lot of work around doing just that, you know, really pricing the products in a sustainable way, not pricing to sell, not, you know, pricing to be competitive with everything else on the market, really understanding our costs and where we want to be. So we made a lot of changes. You really were a pivotal part in that in helping me figure out how to approach that and position my product. I thank you for that. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> it really like set me on this kind of new path. There's a lot of things that I didn't know getting into this. And, you know, we all make a lot of mistakes along the way. I've learned to, yeah, figure them out along the way. I don't think it should stop you from starting. Yeah, it was kind of like this moment of reset where we really focused on pulling back and, you know, taking a moment to understand how the business was going to look going forward from a price standpoint, from a positioning standpoint, packaging. There were a lot of things I ultimately needed to change that I wasn't doing at the beginning because it was a different business. You know, right. it was me making everything by hand in one gallon batches in glass containers and distributing them locally you know, at boutique locations in New York and LA. And while I love that, and that really gave me an amazing foundation for my business and started me out, ultimately, I do want to create clean ingredient products that are more accessible for everyone. Right. And so I was kind of at this crossroads of like, what are the compromises that I do feel are aligned and that I can make? And what do I not want to change? And really like coming back and understanding that you know yeah. like what are what is my ultimate goal i think like the first couple of years were this whirlwind of oh my god this is so exciting you know people actually like yeah. what i'm making and then it was like okay this is a legit business let's step back and figure out how to make it one yeah so from then on i feel like we've been on this trajectory which has been great and so kind of the biggest changes we've made in order to do that are We've gone through some big packaging changes. So we were originally in glass containers. Now we're in these squeezable pouches which I have here. Yeah. And our paper cups. You know, that was a huge kind of evolution of the brand. and something that I feel like was critical to bring our costs down, to make it more accessible, to get into more natural foods, grocery stores, and grocery chains without having to change the ingredients, which I didn't. Yeah. Second to that was figuring out how to scale the process of fermentation without changing the ingredients. So that was something I was like never willing to budge on in combination with the lower cost of packaging. You know, it also helps with shelf life, which is great. And so I did a lot of work over the past couple of years also of figuring out how to scale the production side without changing the ingredients. And yeah. I'm really proud to say that we've been able to do that. It took a lot of time and, and that's okay. You know, I think I <laughs> was putting a lot of pressure on myself in the beginning to like figure it out fast. And that's yeah. when you compromise and you do things that you don't necessarily want to or are best for the business because it's not an alignment. And so yeah. I think coming back to really my original goal and value and that being the light, you know, for me to figure out the path forward was critical. Yeah. So I want to go back to the the packaging decision. So I, I, I know so many founders, as you said, you start out, you're making your product in small batches. As you said, you're making them in, you know, by the gallon, right. And then packaging them, you're in glass, which is also super common for good food founders. We want sustainable products, we want recyclable, reusable, right. And so we make these decisions and they're 
they're totally fine decisions when we're small, when we're selling direct to consumer or we're at a farmer's market or wherever our starting point is. But what I hear you saying is like you realize, and I remember when we met, you were shipping your product as well. So you were selling boutique stores, but you were also shipping your product. Like shipping glass is no joke. Mm-hmm. Like it is heavy. You have a product that needs to be refrigerated and it's breakable. So that was a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> so and- I, I think, so it's like, a couple of things that I want to just kind of like highlight that you're that you're talking about here is one recognizing that like okay this glass might not be the best option for growing the business probably for a variety of reasons right shipping direct to consumer from your online sales but also to a distributor or like shipping to another retailer like it gets dangerous they don't really love dealing in glass either so right so you're like okay I recognize this mm-hmm but what change am I going to make that's not a compromise to my values that still aligns with what you're trying to achieve, but also aligns with the cost reduction that you were also trying to accomplish. Can you talk a little bit about, because you said you don't want to, you didn't want to price competitively. And I think like there you're saying like you needed to price your product based on what that like the margins you needed. You weren't really focusing on volume. You were focusing on 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 a proper margin. But then you also kind of mentioned like reducing the cost in terms of the packaging. Can you dive into that a little bit for us? Are you able to kind of share anything else around that? Sure. Yeah. So initially we were priced competitively, like I mentioned, and our margins weren't sufficient to build a sustainable business. So kind of in coming back to that, you know, it, the product we were producing was actually a lot more expensive than we were pricing it for. So we're like losing money by unit and especially kind of going back to this shipping thing, we were using a three PL losing so much money on like reshipping and broken glass and refrigerated shipping. And people, you know, people are asking me like, why is shipping so expensive? And you know, it's, we're actually, not even you're not even bearing the full cost of the shipment i am just so that i can give you access to it and ultimately products like these they make most sense in retail and that's why i'm not so focused on dtc for refrigerated shipping it's just so expensive and it, it just doesn't work out in reassessing that i think coming back to my goal i do want to get this to more people i do want to make it more accessible where are the places i can cut back the costs you know to have margins that are sustainable and yeah. also price it at a, a place that is not just for boutique premium markets, you know? Yeah. And so it's this kind of balance of figuring out how to lower your cost of packaging, all you know, lowering all of your cost of goods and yeah. all of these elements, which took a long time. Now I, I think we're really priced competitively in some way, but in a in a way that we're not losing money. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like, listen to that. Hear that loud and clear to my founders who are, you know, either just getting started out or, or who, you know, we hear so often like, yes, our margins are really tiny, but it's a volume game. And when we get to a certain level of volume, like then it will make sense. And I, I try to preach like over and over. It's like, you have to know how, like what that volume is. You need to know that very clearly. And you need to know how much investment it will take for you to, to reach that point. And if it's not doable for you, or you don't like what that path looks like, then reassessing cost, reevaluating margin. And, and if I'm going to say fixing some things, but like, yeah, just, just creating the product and the business model that will allow you to be sustainable. And I always tell people, if you can lower costs, like lower the price to your consumer down the road, great, do it, but don't, have a super low price now thinking that you can save your way into the margin as you mm-hmm. grow. It's, it can be a pretty dangerous method. Totally. Yeah. And I, th- I think that's where really my approach now is to grow slower, you know, like yeah. it's okay to grow slower and not to try to run to the finish line and get into the Costco's of the world immediately, you know, right. and just understanding over time, I do, I can get the cost down and bring it to more people, but it takes this kind of slow and intentional and strategic growth of being in higher end markets and then natural foods chains and and kind of this progression of growth that is slower and that's okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, I love that message. The other thing I want to talk about, like, in, and sort of on this section of your business and, and time in your business is it seemed from my perspective, we actually have never met in person. <laughs> and so, I'm, you know, so I we like, <laughs> I know, you know, so I never like, I don't see your operation. And so there's some things that like you tell me and some things that I like perceive. And one of the things I perceived was that there was, I know that there was a halt in shipping for and your mm-hmm. online sales, which can be really frightening for some people to like turn off a revenue stream, even if it's losing money. I know it can be very scary to do that. And then obviously there was a transition from the glass packaging to the new packaging that you shared with us. Can you, I, don't, I want you to kind of describe or like explain to people, like, were you afraid of the slowdown? Was there like a stop to your revenue at any point? What is a transition like that like? And do you have any sort of like advice, even if it's like, don't worry, you'll get through it. Mm-hmm. Or maybe there's something that you maybe would have done differently during that time frame that you want to share with founders. Yeah. I feel like you really helped me kind of make that critical decision of pausing my shipping it was scary. You know, I think at the beginning, I did get a lot of traction and I did want to keep customers happy. And I wanted to keep that option open to make my products available to people. But at a certain point, I had to had to hit the pause button. And it actually, you know, paralleled a lot of like inner work and coming back to just feeling in alignment and not focus so much on this external pressure of like how fast I should be going or how I should be growing the business, you know, it's easy to get wrapped up in that in this CPG world that feels like, you know, we're always looking at what other people are doing and all these new products that are coming out and we got to be the first to da da da, you know? Yeah. I think just realizing like, it's okay to take a pause. The opportunities and the people and the stores, they'll be there when I'm ready. And I don't want to keep on like, being half-ass ready, you know? Mm. I think like I, that was a really good moment for me to learn I don't want to take a pause again. So let's take as long of a pause as we need now to figure yeah. out and lay out a really healthy foundation before we move forward. My advice is to get rid of that noise, like focus on what only you know, and yeah. you know, get back to what feels really aligned for you. I really think that pause was important for me. Kind of in that, we were testing a few larger scale co-manufacturers. We had a lot of failed production runs and we're running into a lot of production issues on that side in tandem at that time. And so in during that period, I paused shipping, I pulled back, I ended up getting a small commercial kitchen in LA and that's how I started. I had a small commercial kitchen in New York and was making everything by hand. And so I'm like, let's just kind of start from the beginning again. and. Mm. I pulled out of our 3PL, like I said, paused shipping, and then came back to this like small local approach as I was yeah. like kind of figuring out my bigger plan. And so, you know, I had to say no to a lot of things. And I just, I took on a few farmers markets in LA and, and kind of just in reassessing my goals at that time started how I did initially. And it kind of bought me my, some time to figure out this like longer term, bigger goal before I then moved into, you know, large scale co manufacturer again and started shipping, which we still do in house. That's one thing, you know, I, I'm still trying to figure out. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of this balance too. I think as a chef and somebody that has, you know, somewhat of a manufacturing background, my family's in food manufacturing and I, I feel like that's actually a really important element to me to have control of, which is why I keep coming back to that. And I would love to find a way ultimately to just have my own manufacturing. You know, I think that control is critical, especially when, yeah, you're, you're like, I, I think the product is the most important thing. And obviously there are great partners out there and we found a great co-manufacturer to help us scale up in the past like six to eight months. But yeah, just really understanding how everything is done yourself first and coming back to that has really helped me. And so I feel really fortunate to, you know, still have my kitchen to, to have this like recalibration period and know how to make the product and do all of that from the get go. So that really, really helped. I think people might have been surprised to hear that you have 
such a like simple yet complex product and you're working with a co-manufacturer because I think a lot of people, you know, I've heard people say like, you know, we choose the best ingredients. We don't get anything pre-chopped. We, you know, we source the best, we chop it all by hand and we want like, and that matters in our product in the, in Mm -hmm. the finished product and to hand it over to, you know, a co-manufacturer, like it wouldn't be the same and it, and it sort of holds people back from being able to grow. Can you talk a little bit about, I mean, how hard was it to find (laughs) a co-man that will like ferment your like very pure ingredient cream mm-hmm. cheese and butter. I feel like I'm the perfect person for this question because <laughs> I think there there is a part of me that held myself back for so long because I'm a perfectionist and I like having control of the process and it is very simple but nuanced and you're dealing with live cultures yeah. and you know variability of the final product and only me and a few people that I've trained like know exactly when it's done and how it tastes and and just going with the flow of that is not really conducive, you know, to a large scale manufacturer where you like give your recipes and everything needs to, you know, yeah. be done in a certain time. So it's a balance, right? I think both options are totally valid. I am kind of like towing the line of both still very much. And like I said, would love to ultimately have my own manufacturing facility, yeah. which it's just going to take a lot of infrastructure and capital that. I don't necessarily want to raise. I'm just going to, you know, wait. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I would say it's worth yeah, trying what feels best for you. I think the, you know, the route that I went is like I have a shared kitchen, so I'd recommend that if you really want to have control over your products and process and want to make them by hand, you mm-hmm. can do that on a smaller scale. But actually, you know, when I think about it, it it just requires so much capital, you know, for the equipment that you need and to really actually scale. I think as a small business still, I don't even understand or can conceive like how big, how fast we can be because we've like haven't gotten to mega scale yet. Yeah. But like it really, there is a huge unlock, you know, in going Mm. from a 30 gallon mixer to a 300 gallon mixer, you know, and in yeah. just the amount you can produce in one day, it's like once you take on one grocery chain, you'd be screwed, you know, with your <laughs> 30 gallon mixer. Yeah. You just need to like be thinking 10 steps ahead before you take on additional business. It really like with food products, you can scale quickly getting into a grocery chain or taking on additional stores. So yeah. I think really it's important if you do want that as your goal to look at a co-manufacturer to look at you know how much product that you can produce and output and it typically makes sense because co-manufacturers have all of the equipment that you need usually you go to one that specializes in something and they already have that full line built out it would cost you hundreds of thousands if not millions of dollars to do that yourself and we don't have the margins for that (laughs) so (laughs) Yeah, I think it's finding the right partner. You know, I think I still very much I'm at every production run. We produce a week a month at our Mm co-manufacturer. I'm there every production run. I still taste every batch. I still very much oversee it. It's not like I've gotten to the point where I'm like, set it and forget it. So, you know, there is a way to work with somebody and also have control and it is worth it. You know, I think if you want to grow, you have to trust people. You have to get out of your comfort zone of doing everything yourself. And I, it took me a long time to get out of my own way and to do that. And even just to start, you know, looking for mm-hmm. co-manufacturers and people that make sense as a partner, it's worth going through those steps if you do want to grow because you can only do so much yourself. You know, I, I still go through like moments of burnout after doing, you know, this for five years now, I'm like, I'm so glad I am not making it by hand anymore. I love and appreciate that fresh product so much. And I wish I could do it and make it for everyone, but my hands hurt, you know, and I, (laughs) I would rather somebody else do it. And I try and I'm like, Oh my God, they did, they did it. And it's as good as mine. Like I actually am really proud. The product that we're putting out now is better than the small Wow. Like, you know, scale product that we were making because we have the right equipment. It's smoother. You know, we figured out the unlock of 
the fermentation and keeping it stable at bigger couple hundred gallon batches now, which took me a long time to do and to test and to like scale that up incrementally. But it was worth going through that so that I don't have to make yeah. this for the rest of my life. And yeah. Yeah, I feel like in many ways this is like this is so much my passion and my calling and what I want to do, but I also yeah, don't want to spend every day in and out doing just this. There's so many other aspects of the business that I want to focus on and so many other businesses and foods that I want to create. <laughs> so, it's worth I love it. That. <laughs> That's awesome. So, you and I when we were talking before, you know, recording the podcast a couple I think it was last week, you talked about that you had you initially were like I want to be big and then you're like wait, I need to like bring it back a little bit as you talked about you kind of like pulled it in, recalibrated, took a pause in a lot of ways. But now you've got that that I don't want to call it an itch, but you've got the goal of being bigger again, but your guardrail is the ability to create the product the way you're creating it now. So I think that that's a really interesting thing too. Like you're showing so much restraint, I think more restraint than a lot of founders I've talked to and that I've had on the podcast. And so it's interesting to me to talk about the big goals that you have and how far you want your product to go but that you are going to let the product and the process and the ability to, to maintain the quality be that guardrail for, for mm-hmm. how that happens. I right. loved that. Yeah. I, I always say I only want to be as big as the product allows. Now I feel like so rooted in my guardrails of keeping the ingredients and the product the same. And I know it's possible. There's just like this inner knowing I have that it is possible to be really big and keep everything the same. So yeah. I'm kind of just like trusting in the timing of that. Yeah. And like I said, really taking this slow, intentional growth approach. And eventually we will be everywhere and we will be, you know, the go-to dairy-free cream cheese in every market and every bodega. Yeah, that may take longer than I think, but I will build a much better foundation and sustainable business along the way. And yeah. I'll be around longer doing it that that way. So Yeah. I think that's awesome. Can you tell us where your product is being sold today? So we're really focused on New York and LA distribution right now. Those are our two key markets. In LA, as you know, we're at Erewhon and we just got into Bristol Farms. We'll be available at Gelson's in the coming coming months and just started working with a new distributor that they work with, which is exciting and will open a lot more doors for us. And really that's the plan is to focus on saturating LA SoCal market first. Can find us online, livemontes.com. In New York, we're at Pop-Up Grocer, Pop-Up Bagel, a few you know smaller stores like that that are LS soon. And we do have a lot of food service accounts, which is also something I should mention is like yeah. been a great foundation for my business too. And like having a different avenue and really helped me sustain the retail side, honestly. So I also sell my cream cheese and butter for food service through Baldor now to restaurants and cafes. I work a lot with Sakara, this plant-based delivery service. They use my cream cheese and a sour cream I make just for them on their menu and over 50 dishes. And uh, Levon Bakery uses our butter in their vegan gluten-free cookie, which is awesome. Amazing. 16 mil, so many amazing bakers and chefs. I Like that to me is what is exciting. And yeah. I love keeping the food service part of my business an important part of it and giving people a chance to try it and give them ideas of how to use it and yeah. inspire them to bake with it. And so- well- I didn't realize that the food service piece was that big for you. And so now I want to I want to ask some questions about that. Mm-hmm. That's okay. So mm-hmm. were you doing food service sort of all along? Did that come up during the recalibration period as I keep referring to it as? Or like how did that become a part of your business model? It always was, okay. you know. So I had a couple key accounts from when I first started. And uh, I would say that's probably what kept me alive, kept me going. If not, I, you know, if not, if the retail side didn't work out and I figured the cogs didn't work, I would have probably just kept doing food service, yeah. honestly. And so, yeah, there's a part of me that just wants to do this thing and it exists and like it take its form in the way that makes sense, you know, for all of us. But yeah, I would say that really, 
like kept me going, honestly. Yeah. And then more and more, I feel like over the past couple of years, I've prioritized growing that side of the business. And it's it's definitely, I would say at least 50% of my revenue. I think that's amazing yeah. to talk about. Mm-hmm. I think it's amazing to share too, because generally margins are different, you know, between food service and, and retail, right? Especially the more people mm-hmm. you add to that retail chain, the lower mm-hmm. the, the margins can get. You're also selling in slightly higher volumes, mm-hmm. typically to food service. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know what, mm-hmm. what the packaging is there, but you know, it just oftentimes that packaging cost as a percentage of the price is a lot lower in food totally. service. Yeah. No, uh, we have great margins in food service. Honestly, I feel like there's one thing I I always come back to. My so my dad is my biggest mentor and somebody I look to for advice on everything. He has a food business, like I mentioned, and he's always kind of telling me like, "You need to sell tonnage, you know, for it to, for it to work." <laughs> and so that's kind of like where it comes from in the back of my mind. As you know, you know, I think there is a yeah, volume aspect to this business and it, it working, you know, in many ways, food service is easier. You know, yeah. you're, you're like selling in less expensive packaging in bulk packaging, tollings, lower packaging's lower. Yeah. It's a little bit more passive, you know, it doesn't require as much trade spend and marketing, yeah. you know? And so yeah. in that regard, margins are comparable, but it's, it requires less, you yeah. know? So yeah. It is a great avenue for anyone to diversify your business is critical. You know, I think just putting all your eggs in one basket is very risky and markets close all the time and you don't know what, there's a lot of things out of your control. So focus on what you can. Yeah. I think it's, it's so interesting to kind of going back to that comparison piece and you know, how easy it is to compare yourself to others or, you know, people talk a lot about that, like shiny object thing or like, you know, what looks like a win to someone externally, right? So showing up on a new retail shelf, that looks like a win to everybody else. Mm -hmm. Selling into a bakery or into like a food service program doesn't look as shiny sometimes to Mm -hmm. the audience who might be taking in like your Instagram or, or, you know, whatever, however, they're, they're kind of learning about your business, but from the business perspective, from the inside, that's a big win, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's something to be said about that. And and the fact that in so many ways you're saying, what is right for me? How Mm -hmm. do I get to that quote unquote tonnage and have it not be in the way of only distributing, you know, whatever it is, like eight ounce packages to grocery stores, right? Like how, Mm -hmm. what is the way we can almost work smarter, not harder? to achieve that end goal of feeding people, of getting your product, you know, into as many hands and mouths and bellies as possible and, Mm -hmm. and getting big, but it can look lots of different ways. And and I love that you're like, yeah. Yeah. No, I think that I, you know, I fell into that trap early on too, of like creating the brand and, you know, like the exciting moments of your, you know, you get onto a retail shelf. It's one thing to get on a shelf at another to stay there and to like create a brand with longevity. And so really I, that's what I want, you know, and like my ultimate goal is to create more consciousness through food and to get my product to more people, even if they don't know it's Monty's, if they're eating it in a scone (laughs) and they love it and they have this beautiful moment and they feel good after they eat it. I've done my job, you know, yeah. who cares, who cares if it's Monty's? I, it, it just doesn't matter so much to me anymore. Yeah. That's really beautiful. My last question for you, because I know that this happens or, or, or is asked of you a lot. Like people ask you like, how do I get started? I should mention this. You, you yourself are a mentor to a lot of women in our community you know, you were recommended to come on the podcast by a few, but there are many women who know you and who like, you know, every other month it's like, oh my gosh, do you know Lauren? I love Lauren. She's been so helpful to me. She's provided guidance to me in this way or that way. She helped me get started. She helped me understand, you know, some of the basics of co-manufacturing. And there's just like so many women. And I think it's such a, it's a, it's a much needed thing in our community of CPG to, you know, women supporting women, I think universally, I think it's really important. So I just wanted to add that here that like, Thank you for that and and on their behalf for the support that you've given them. But with people coming to you and saying, how do I get started? And and how do I do this? Should I do this? You know, Mm -hmm. what is your advice for them? 
so much. Um, <laughs> well, I just want to say thank you. And to all of those women, I feel just like so grateful, you know, to, to be able to work with them and to share anything that I've learned. You know, I think there's a part of me that still has imposter syndrome and is still like learning as I go. I'm like, I don't know anything, you know, <laughs> yeah. and I've, I've learned a lot, you know, in doing. So that's really my advice is to just do like follow your curiosities to learn and follow what lights you up, you know, like to me, it actually is like really easy once you start doing that and following those pings. And I don't want to say that you have to do everything yourself because I outsource a lot of things, but I have learned the fundamentals of everything. And I do mm -hmm. think there is an important element of finding the thing that you're so excited about learning everything about and want to take ownership of and be passionate about because you have to live, breathe, die for this to work. You know, yeah. it, it's the only way it's, it's all consuming. And I feel like, you know, people come to me like, what should I make or how should I make it? And it's like, find the thing that you become so obsessed with, want to learn everything about. And are, that's what people love is yeah. like, you're, and you're sharing your energy ultimately. Like I, I share a product, but this is like me, you know, mm -hmm. in a, in a package, which is why it's, it's so personal. Yeah. I think really coming to that, it's definitely not a path for everyone. So mm -hmm. it's like, take a hard look if you want this to be your life. It can look different ways, you know, like deciding what your goals are and what you want your life to look like. All of yeah. these things really matter before you start anything. And I would say like, don't, get in your own way of starting. You know, I've, like I said, I've learned so much over the past five years. I really feel like I started a couple of years ago when we worked together because I'm like, I don't want to count all that other, all those other mistakes I made, but it's all a part of the journey. And it's like, you got to start somewhere. Nobody knows everything. I certainly don't, you know, I'm learning so much along the way and it's just like start and share your love and energy for something. And it actually like flows and becomes really easy once you start doing that. I think that's amazing advice. Yeah. I'm, I'm that person who jumps and like the net will appear, hopefully kind of person. <laughs> so for better or for worse, I, yeah, I think just get started and, you know, I am a numbers person. I do like data. I do like informed decisions, but I think, <laughs> you know, with that has to come that passion that you talked about and, and, and that desire, like, it's almost like you can't go on if you don't do this thing. Totally. And that's why I need you for the data driven <laughs> decisions. And I think admitting what you don't know, seeking out the answers, you know, with people that do. Yeah. It's a balance. You can't be all the things. No, no. And no one can. And it's like, I, in a million years, I never would have thought I would I would have a podcast, but then it became I can't not talk out loud about these things. I can't not right, and so it's just like sort of following as you call them those those pings of like I need to do this. I'm being called to do this. I don't know exactly how this is all going to take shape or like turn out, but I will follow my instincts and do mm -hmm. what is aligned with me, and then also look at the numbers and and make sure that this makes sense so I can keep doing it for mm -hmm. as long as I want to. Right. So it's like, a, Absolutely. it is a good balance. Yeah. I think in like doing that and learning how to attune yourself to follow those pings and those downloads is like taking really good care of yourself and eating clean and, you know, coming back to the foundations yeah. of like why I'm doing this and creating a product like this, those things actually give you the clarity and to move forward and to share your energy and all of that with people. It like starts with how you take care of and all of the inputs yeah. that you you have yourself. Yeah. We had another founder on, Jeff, who's the founder of a, of a coffee company. And he talked a lot about healthy and like having like a healthy business, but also having a healthy life and how you mm -hmm. can't have a healthy business without a healthy life. And that means like balance and family time and rest and, and time away and, and, you know, all of those things. And I think from, you know, we're just kind of emerging, I think from the hustle mentality mindset, you know what I mean? So it's nice to hear, you know, founders talking about prioritizing rest while also growing your business. It's not like mm -hmm. rest and taking care of yourself means like you avoid or just kind of whatever happens with the business happens with the business that like you can still drive that forward and possibly mm -hmm. even better 
when mm-hmm. you've taken care of yourself in the ways okay. that, that, you know, are good for you. So I love, totally. I love that advice. Awesome. Well, Lauren, you, you shared with us where folks can find your product. If they want to follow you on social or learn more about your brand and you, where can they get that information? You can follow us at Monty's NYC because that's where we started. (laughs) I still haven't changed it. And at the full Lauren Monty online live Monty's.com. Amazing. Thank you so much for being here, Lauren. I really enjoyed our time together. I hope you have an amazing day. Thank you so much. Looking for more content like this? Subscribe to our YouTube channel. You'll see weekly podcast episodes as well as other content related to the show. Just visit youtube.com forward slash at the good food CFO. Thank you for joining us here today. If you enjoyed this episode or found it helpful or inspiring in any way, please share it with your founder friends on social and rate and review the podcast wherever you listen. It's the number one way to help good food founders find the show. We'll be back with a brand new episode next week.